Um, shall we resume? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so, so seven football also do not uh, is not suspended in Bakken. It is located within other uh, football cultures, uh, like the official football formats, like elevens, and there is I League, there is Federation. Uh, you know, all, all sort of tournaments are there, and seven football is also kind of connected with these. Uh, the players would feel the pressure of official bodies at many times. But the, uh, many players would risk uh, playing sevens, even though they they know that there are fines and suspensions and all that. And uh, you know, there was a the um, in 2016 they had started some kind of negotiation with Kerala Football Association to avoid uh, such punishments for the players. Um, the problem is the official uh, bodies of football cannot completely recognize sevens football. There are some um, issues when it comes to standardization, right? That is where the power comes in, right? Who decides who can play what? Yes. So the, the football network is also, as uh, Dr. Nafil said, it's also transnational, right? The um, rules of association footballs are codified. So when a sport is standardized, when the rules are codified, it becomes very difficult to uh, accommodate different formats. Yes. So the official bodies will always try to draw some boundary. They will always um, try to uh, demark their area. What is football and what is not football, right? But there are football with fights, right, which is, which is recognized by FIFA. Right? Uh, so sevens is between this recognition and misrecognition. It is uh, on the one hand promoted by the um, football lovers, but it is penalized by the official bodies of football. So the power also works in different ways um, when it comes within the sport. Um, so sevens football is localized. It's it, it, it could be defined as a local enunciation of football in Malabar. But at the same same time, it's transnational. Even within India, you will see sevens football being played in parts of Punjab and Tamil Nadu. But the transnational movement is pretty interesting. If you look at the Malayali diaspora, people who have migrated to Gulf, they they uh, playing um, sevens football as part of their coming together. Right? It's an important... Um, part of socializing for men, those who move beyond. You know, sport is something which is nostalgic, uh, which is a good pastime uh, to spend your time and also to kind of, uh, you know, um, feel connected to your roots. There's all, a lot of sentiments attached with seventh football, especially uh, people who live um, in Gulf for generations even. So the regional, national, and the global network of, of football is very exciting to study. And it will open many doors to study class, migration, diaspora, identity, work, um, gender roles, etc. Et um, this, this must be fairly obvious for all of you um, because, you know, Suda, as uh, in Sudani from Nigeria showed us, how it's also form of global work. You know, even when we say that uh, sevens football is a, it's a local phenomena, it generates work globally. There is football and migration uh, networks that work hand in hand with sevens tournaments. Right? This managers and agents network where uh, people from African countries come here and play. Uh, and the, as the movie rightly shows, in many aspects, it's also attached with class. Who are these uh, people, young men, right, from um, age 18 uh, to 23 mostly, who come here to play um, uh, for piecemeal work? You know, for each match, they will get this amount of money. Um, uh, who are these men? What are their locations? Why do they take such huge risk coming here to play football? Of course, the money is good. But think about it, right? You're at a very young age and you're traveling um, across nations to come here and work. Work in a sport which is not officially recognized. 
Yes. Uh, so who are these men? What are their class backgrounds? What kind of work is not available for them in their own countries so that they choose to work here? Uh, that is another um, big, um, uh, you know, site which is unexplored. So Danny from Nigeria showed us some glimpses but that is a whole lot of site which we need to uh, learn study and understand managers and agents network is also an interesting way to look at food how football works for this local phenomenon to work to have so many football tournaments to happen in um, northern parts of kerala it's an international network working Right? So who are these managers? Who are these agents who are working to ensure that players come here and play? And what are the kind of money transactions that happen uh, among them? Questions of national identity. The national identity is also closely connected with race question, right? Um, you know, um, again, Sudani from Nigeria is a very good example where if you have noticed the um, the commentaries, right? If you go to a sevens football, the, the way in which um, African players are uh, described, right? Extremely racial imageries, right? In that movie, there is a dialogue when say, um, imported bodies are in the right? So the um, understanding of certain races, uh, it's, it's brilliantly placed. So uh, we, there is a um, um, you know, default understanding that, you know, black bodies are good in sports. They're they are much stronger than us, right? I remember um, this one particular encounter that happened in my fieldwork where there was a player uh, from Code who was, uh, who could be called as mixed race. His uh, father uh, was in Omani and mother was from Code Code. And he would, uh, he, uh, and people thought he looked like a black man. And he would say, why, why, why don't you pretend that you are a black man so that you will get better pay? And he would say that, no, no, I'm okay with um, this pay, but I don't want to be called a Sudu. Right? So, so the, this interesting question of race, class, and money, and sporting ability, right? certain racialization of work, these are all interesting uh, domains which needs our attention because this is happening and even though all of us know these things, we have not studied it through these lenses. And if we begin to look at sport as work, sport as an avenue of migration, many things would open up. We would understand our society in a better way. So we will stop looking at sport as merely as an escape. Here I'm not... Um, dismissing the idea that sport is pleasurable. Of course, sports are extremely pleasurable. That is why we have so many tournaments and matches happening. But at the same time, in a country like India, pleasure cannot be the only motivator for people to do something in a consistent manner, right? Because of our socio-economic political locations, there must be other motivations behind these, uh, behind the people. So uh, one of my international reviewer got very offended. I'm sure he is a Malayali from uh, Malabar. He got very offended saying that, but why are you calling it a work? It's, it's such a pleasurable activity. That, I think that's exactly our problem. We think something as, um, you know, either or, either work, either pleasurable. But in many cases, it's both. So we need to look at sport in such a complex manner, which brings together pleasure, identity, work, migration, um, you know, masculinity. You know, all these men struggle so hard. So when I ask them, why are you, you know, um, taking so much uh, effort in order to make money? They say we have to take care of our families. So the masculinity is so much tied with the provider role in the family. Right. So the family is a very important factor when you speak to most of these football fans and football players. So what kind of masculinity do these um, players or fans project? Yes, that's also very important. So what are the implications if we begin to look at sevens footballers work? We will start looking at sporting body also as laboring body. Um, we will look so we will look at football players as also football workers. This became very important during the pandemic. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm still audible. Yes, yes, you are. Okay. 
Um, so this became very important during the pandemic. One of the sevens football players who also played in professional leagues, uh, national professional leagues, wrote an article first in Facebook and then in uh, one of the uh, dailies saying that, you know, government should also pay attention to the loss of jobs in sevens football. Right. Um, you know, the government was actively speaking about economy, actively speaking about loss in jobs in this sector, that sector. Right. And suddenly this person was saying, you know, seven football is also a form of work and we have also lost work. So um, it felt that more than any economic incentive, there was this craving to be recognized. Right. We are talking about all kinds of loss of work. We have also lost work. Seven football matches did not happen during the time. So we have also lost work. So, um, so that engagement with, with the government, claiming uh, the, uh, the um, position of a worker from a sevens football player was very interesting. Uh, it's also to be noted that this time uh, for the next five year plan, um, our uh, government has formed a working group uh, exclusively for sports. This is the first time they're forming a working group to study sports in the state. Uh, and one thing which was very exciting was that they were not only looking at elite sports, they were looking at how to democratize sports. So it is not, um, for a state like Kerala, it's not necessary that we get one or two Olympic medals. We need a mass participation of sport. We need good playing grounds accessible for everybody, not just elite athletes. So I was very excited to know that the working group uh, was invested not only in elite sports, but also in certain democratization of the sport. Sevens as spectator sport. So if we look, start looking at sevens football as work, certain um narrations would change for example when whenever when i went to field for the first time you know uh, you, you of course you know how sevens is called cutter sevens right a tough violent form of football but when you start looking at sporting bodies and laboring bodies the performance of violence is very superficial right you need to show the spectators that it's a rough game so that spectators come to watch that they they really enjoy that roughness the toughness on the field but among players they are very uh, connected they would say that you know no no it's not worth it let's not lose our body because we need to work with this body right so the spectatorship is important the spectacle is very important but players have an understanding that we can we cannot do a lot of uh, toughness on the ground because we need to guard our bodies from injuries because this is a form of work. We need our body for the next day's work. So most of the violence, um, most of the violence, I'm not saying all the violence, most of the violence is performative. It's, it's, it's just, you know, it, it is for us. Uh, and yes, indeed, it is tougher than the 11th football because of small space and the pace, fastness, everything. But when we begin to look at it through the lens of work, lens of laboring body, some of these spectacle uh, will be unraveled, which was very interesting for me. So this is just one implication. There will be many other narratives coming out if we begin to look at sport also as a form of work. I'm not asking to dismiss the pleasurable aspect, but to look at these regional cultures as speaking to us about certain economies, certain cultural identities, and certain regional pride. So I will stop here. And we can open up for Q&A if that's okay. Thank you so much for listening. That, that was good, Veena. Uh, uh, quite, quite happy uh, to see you. Uh, you know, on, on full swing with the ball. Uh, uh, and there were quite a lot of things that we, we, we could, I mean, I, I personally could relate with. Anyway, we will uh, go into the discussions. Uh, so uh, uh, please, if you have uh, something to share with the presenter, uh, please turn your mic on and we will start the discussions.
we know in order to you know uh, uh, you know to start the discussions hello good evening yeah hello yeah. yeah, yeah. yes go ahead salman yes Am I audible? Yes, you are. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you are, Salma. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry for the delay, actually. Uh, ma'am, I don't know whether uh, you remember my name. We have uh, we had communicated over emails uh, a few months back. Uh, I mean, uh, I told you that I, I I'm working on the production of female athletic identities in visual culture. Uh, so I mean that is not the correct question here. Uh, anyway. Ma'am, uh, you pointed out that uh, uh, actually how uh, the pleasure pr uh, pr principle is something that is uh, often being highlighted when we talk about sport. And uh, if you need to have a serious um, awareness or a serious study on sports studies, uh, uh, you need to go beyond that. And researchers need to start to consider uh, sport as a serious category of analysis. Uh, but uh, Ma'am, uh, actually, uh, why sport is a neglected area of sociological analysis? I mean, uh, even when researchers start to uh, consider sport as a serious category of analysis, uh, don't you think that uh, there is this uh, mild aversion towards sport even, uh, I mean, uh, even to consider sport within the purview of cultural studies, uh, I mean, in uh, at least in inter-academy. I'm not uh, talking about the global uh, scenario because uh, over the past one year, I've been reading on this particular field and while I've been searching for materials, what I uh, found is that, I mean, uh, when you go back to 2004, uh, there, there is this work by um, Deepesh Chakravarti. Uh, I guess uh, the title of the work is The Rise and Fall of uh, Indian Sport History and where he cites that uh, uh, the future of sports studies is in, uh, I mean, cultural studies. So, uh, I mean, that statement came out in 2004, if my memory is right. And uh, now we are talking in 2021 and I couldn't find uh, many works when I, I mean, when I was digging for materials for my research. And Often, as you pointed out, there is this association, there is this mainstream association of sport with, uh, I mean, sport is something uh, in, that is intrinsically innocent, uh, playful, liberating, uh, or the, the common associations of physical body with sport, or the common, I mean, sport is a liberating activity, or as you pointed out, how it gives pleasure. So that is the image that is dominating. At the same time, uh, when you look at uh, authors who have uh, talked about uh, cultural studies, I mean, discuss authors who have discussed sport uh, within the from the perspective of uh, cultural studies, like Bodu, how he uh, describes sport as a physical capital, and all that, you have ample scope. But at the same time, even uh, to cite one of the uh, one of my personal experiences, one of my professors during uh, one of the PhD interviews that I attended, uh, he was. Uh, giving me, an, uh, me a suggestion that I should sideline the sport part and highlight my theory part or methodology part as if sport is not a, not a worthy category of analysis. And that was one of the criticisms uh, directed against my topic. So uh, do you think that, uh, I mean, even when researchers come forward to uh, start or when they start to consider sport as a serious category of analysis, uh, I'm sorry to say this, I'm not, uh, I mean, this is not a general uh, critique or something like that, but don't you think that uh, even uh, professors, most of the professors, I can say, uh, have this mild aversion towards sports studies to conceive sports studies or include, include or incorporate sports studies within the purview of cultural studies. Uh, thank you, Salman, for that question. I think I, I began my um, uh, presentation with this question. So even globally, sports studies is not really um, uh, something which is um, on the top, on demand, right? Usually sports studies is relegated to the physical education departments, kinesiology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
so the subcategory of sociology of sport itself claims that you know we still we have been here for 40 years or more but we still don't have that um, importance in sociology departments this is this was the recent complaint her, heard from one of the top professors in sociology sport in the us right? they have a 40 year history of the discipline but still they feel like they are sidelined uh, when it comes to india there are two things one is that with sport we have always talked about sport as something as an escape from life so uh, social sciences or humanities uh, study life right so sport is an escape from life so we we ourselves have claimed that it's an escape so that is one reason why people did not feel it's it's worthy of study that is one thing second is clearly ideological second is that who plays sport right so uh, the, the question of subaltern, uh, all that have risen only recently. Yes. So um, whatever rich people do would be worthy of attention or, or you know, there's this kind of um, uh, different attachments to sport. That might be another reason. Thirdly, your professors will be well-meaning. Actually, it is very difficult in the job market if your focus is on sport. I have to constantly defend myself that, um, you know, um, I guess I can also teach other other subjects. The thing is, when you are when you apply for a job, uh, they would also look at what courses you can teach. In India, there are no sports courses. Uh, they, so either you have to situate yourself within the literature department or within uh, sociology department, if you're lucky in anthropology department. Yes. So uh, your professors are well-meaning. Now I understand it. Um, however, one optimistic note I want to give you is that there are many scholars now working in sport. So and um, sociology of sport has an Indian chapter now, and many of the um, sociology of sport practitioners across the world are eagerly looking at Indian scholars on what we have to say about sport in India. So it is an upcoming field, but it is very slow. Uh, also, there are certain um, uh, topics which the international or the West expects us to study. Right. If you are from India, you have to study religion, uh, preferably Islam or um, you know Hinduism, um, and you can study about poverty. Right. You can study about uh, violence against women. So there are certain topics which are assigned to us. It's it's as if saying a black person should study race alone. Right. These are all stereotypes that which are imposed on us. We have to talk about only these things. Sport is not a very important thing where we can contribute, is the understanding. Uh, but I think it is changing. Now we have audience. Um, and at the end of the day, it's all about what you want to do. Right? Um, I was naive uh, and uh, too excited about football back then. So I defended and I had my supervisor to support me and I found my doctoral committee members to support me throughout the journey. Uh, but if I was smart academically, maybe I would have taken some hot topic, you know, uh, research in Malabar, you know, if it was religion, it would be hot buns. Uh, yes, so uh, there are certain, um, you know, uh, preferences, but I, re I really wanted to study this. So it's all about our preferences and hoping that, you know, you will find your own Right. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> uh, hi, ma'am. My name is Annie. Um, could you tell us hi, more about the? Could you tell us more about the gendered aspect of it? You as a female researcher, uh, researching on sports, uh, particularly a very masculine sport such as uh, football. What is considered masculine? That is. Could you tell us about your experience? Um, Thank you so much, Annie. Uh, so in ethnography, the study is um, a lot of shaped by the positionality of the researcher. So when I am in the field, all the data I get will be in one way or the other mediated by my different kinds of positionality. So a couple of positionalities mattered really in my field. One that I was a woman it denied me certain access. For example, I couldn't hear what they spoke in their locker rooms, in their dressing rooms, 
right? So I, I was denied all that um, conversations. Uh, second, another positionality which really um, was important to me was that I was an outsider. I really don't know if a woman from Kori Court or from you know, a certain locality would get access. You know, I don't think she or the players would be comfortable speaking with a woman from that region. They felt comfortable with me knowing that I'm not from that region. So they, they felt that it's all right, you know, uh, they can safely tell me certain things. Um, so uh, that these two positionalities mattered a lot. Um, and uh, it gave me access uh, in many ways that I could speak to the family members. I could stay with many of the families. So um, they were very generous. They were very kind. Um, and also uh, about certain things. I felt that these players told me certain things only because I was a woman. Uh, I, I do not think they would have shared their anxieties or their vulnerabilities with a man in the same way they, they um, you know, uh, spoke with me. So my gender allowed me certain access and it also denied me certain uh, access. Mm. And the thing is also the languages in which they speak about pleasure, right? Uh, there will be certain kinds of romance. The, there will be certain kinds of them speaking about their girlfriends or wives to me, right? So they, that, that all gave me certain insights into the life these men led and how important sport is for them because uh, of these life choices, because of their partners they chose. So... Uh, yes, that um, my gender location was an important uh, shaper in my research. Same happened. We do not. Um, thanks a lot for this question, Annie. I hope that all of us ask this question to male researchers also. Most of the time, we do not ask this to male researchers. Their, their male location also shapes their research. Right? If, it, if this was a male researcher, we do not think to ask this question. But I think. Uh, especially if you speak, look at many of the religion studies, it's all based on men's experience. Because the researcher is male, they would have access only to men, mostly. So the religious experience is much more messy and entangled. Sports experience is much more messy and entangled. It's not neat. Right? So uh, I think that messiness is not coming out in the research papers or books because the male researchers are not critical of their own gender locations. But female researchers are constantly forced to. Uh, I, I would also like to add one more thing, Annie. The, another interesting thing was every day I would consciously dress. Uh, I would, I would, um, I, um, uh, you know, I would, uh, I, there was certain deliberateness in the way I dressed in the field. Because at the same time, I do not want to, uh, you know, I, uh, I want to kind of, uh, you know, I needed access to many spaces. So I would try to dress in, in what is considered to be a norm in spaces in Kolkod and Malapuram. But at the same time, I wanted my outsider um, identity to show up so that I'm not policed. You know, um, so, you, you know, it, I, I don't know whether male researchers also do a lot of work on how they present themselves in the field. I'm sure they do, but they do not talk about it a lot. Thank you. Uh, they that was so fascinating to listen, man. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank Devendran has a question. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are. Okay, I'm Sunil. Uh, Ma'am, I agree with your uh, research and the research that you've done on the sevens football in Malapuram. Uh, it's, uh, your findings are also very fascinating. Of course, we'll invite some further studies from the gender's perspective also, I think. But my question, if we take football as a text, a broader text, right? You did your, your findings were, and your talk was also from the perspective that you did the research for that anthropological purpose perspective. But if you take football as a, as a text, 
of course it has an aesthetics right so if uh, from the aesthetic from the financial side uh, why uh, you know families promote the children to come more and more to football um to uh, especially uh, those uh, parents who promote their children to aspire a uh, future in football apart from all these things there would be a very good aesthetic level for football that uh, catches the minds of uh, you know large number of people across cultures across politics and everything uh, even in kerala also if we um, if we take the sevens football culture now uh, also we see large number of women also especially girls come to watch football sevens football matches so from the perspective of the uh, viewer uh what what is the pleasure that or what is the vital thing in football that uh, really attracts the uh, the attention of the viewer apart from the other things from the aesthetic mm. point of view what what did you find uh, thank you so much uh, for this question Be- uh, because the spectator is also an important part of football culture so uh, one thing which i found um, very um, real is the experience of the spectator when you are in that um, gallery right you feel that excitement so it's bodily experience right that the flood lit the the soil the red soil you know that the level the ground that that passion that frenzy it it also kind of circulates um in the gallery right um i uh, and it is very different for sevens football it is very different in an elevens football and it is very different in isl all these uh, the the spectators pleasure is also very different uh, i found it very um, um glaring uh, during um, the nagji set uh, set nagji football in cold court um, because um, either we need sevens football because the we love the closeness to the action right the galleries are so close in sevens football so you can actually feel that uh, excitement bodily uh, with set nagji uh, football there was not much excitement it, i think it was in 2014 that happened in the, the last uh, season happened in um, cold court stadium and people were saying no there is no frenzy that is because we are so used to the televised sports which shows very closely the action so the closeness with action is very important for sports so either we need televised you know replays uh, very close shots um you know with slow motions right otherwise we need sevens where the action is right in front of your eyes uh, so that is why uh, the you know this is different from cricket right you need that kind of closeness and attachments another thing which the which gives pleasure to um the spectators in sevens football is the familiarity you have with the players you know most of these players by name right so uh, that familiarity that localness that feeling of community i think that also uh, makes it a lot of um, you know excited okay ma'am thank you huh? uh bina i wanted to uh, ask you uh, your thoughts on one thing uh, when you were mentioning football as a work you know uh, especially uh, in, against that representation in in sudan from nigeria uh, there is a stigma associated with the football as a work right that is presented in the film uh, uh, i mean that's something uh, most of us uh, personally face also i mean not me particularly but i have close friends uh, sunil sunil can you turn your mic off okay so yeah uh, so uh, i i had this you know one friend i was thinking of sharing it with you i had this friend and a cousin also who are into football and and they haven't got the kind of job that i have so every time when our family comes together you know their mothers have something to compare i as like got something and their sons haven't got that you know and that stigma is there so people often get this you know as as you said in the beginning there's this 
class associated with the you know uh, uh, individuals association with a particular sport item uh, in the same way there is this class categorization uh, that you put the football player who have who has you know taken it as a profession into a particular class of you know job you know that's that's not considered to be a job uh, you have that incident in the film right where the marriage proposal is thought to, uh, because when majid says uh, what he does is that missile blows and then the game gets over right so uh, what's your thoughts about that the stigma associated with uh, football as a work um thanks nafil for that so the there's a lot of silence attached with football as work uh, because it is not seen as a respectable job however uh, not all football work is non respectable right if you play for a club like mohan bagan right then you are respected so which le- level of football you play decides the respectability and that is why many men did not want to speak about uh, their football work um in fact i was not sure whether i should write about it uh because i thought you know many men are not very comfortable talking about it uh, is it all right for me an outsider uh, from a privileged location in terms of education you know whatever from institutional location i am much more privileged so i had this moral dilemma Uh, whether to write about something which for for many it's also a matter of shame that they have to depend on this game for money because they do not have other avenues no no other educational or job avenues uh, so i had this dilemma then i realized that they were very much comfortable me writing about it they want somebody to write about it but they didn't want to talk about it themselves so the uh, player who wrote in uh, facebook and in uh malayalam daily about football as work not only played sevens football he was part of an elite club in bengal so he play he was a professional footballer but he he also played sevens during off seasons so that is why he was able to articulate it but many men still find they are shamed so they they still they are not comfortable speaking about it so i can speak about it because of my privilege so i completely understand how you know many of us can actively speak about it and some cannot at the same time this was not as stigmatized as before uh, when i spoke to many of the senior players who are in their 50s um they did not find it very um you know especially players in black and white or super studio teams they were all right they they openly spoke about you know it was still a respectable job so it it is only in recent time that this became a non respectable job because other avenues have opened up for many people now the educational scenario is different now there are other job opportunities there is opportunities to migrate to other countries so uh, maybe it so it also shows that certain development is happening in malabar that this job is becoming non respectable but still many men rely on this job thank you thank is that all uh yeah <laughs> no no uh, one more thing i uh, if there is another no question i i wanted to you know uh, see how do you look at it uh, was uh, the idea is there any you know class directive in in you know playing a role in deciding one's liking for a particular you know you know sport i mean like people take it consciously uh, to be part of you know cricket in order to place their social status uh, or or uh, have you met any any such kind of instances in your field um 
so this question is addressed by a sociologist not Pierre Bourdieu, who spoke about habitus, basically the kind of uh, sports we are associated with is closely associated with the class we are. In. So, uh, for example, when I went to field uh, from my innocence and naivety, I used to ask men, when did you start playing football? And they would have no answer, right? How many of you can remember when you started playing football? But at the same time, if you ask a woman, they would remember. Because men start playing a sport much early in their life, when they are very young, when they go to Maidan, when they go out with their brothers or father, you know, they you start playing. But I, start, I, I remember playing basketball. I started playing basketball when I was in fifth standard because it was in the school, um, you know, organized disciplined manner but men in Malaba start playing football you know uh, unconsciously they do not choose the sport the choose uh, choose sport chooses them so because football is available to them right if if you so because there is a football culture already there and you're born into it um that is one thing so uh, where you're born decides a lot of access um then if, if you are in certain elite class and if you feel then you when you consciously decide that okay um, i want my son or my daughter to play in this particular sport for example who can afford tennis uh, coaching classes tennis is an expensive game cricket is professional cricket is relatively an expensive game yes so certain sport is expensive by its nature the, the another reason which why football is popular is also because of the landscape, right? Cricket is usually understood to be needed much more space um, than football, right? And for, for a location like beach, you know, we have long coastal area and coasts are most suitable for volleyball and football, right? And in addition to water sports. But you cannot play a lot of cricket, uh, you know, in the beach. So your location determines and your exposure to certain games determines what type of game you will play in the future. Um, so you will see uh, that most of the uh, women, elite women in uh, sports women in Kerala played individual sports items. Either they were athletics or playing shuttle or um, squash. Um, it's very difficult for women to consistently play team sports because you need all, you know, you need to keep them together. They might drop out because of societal pressures. So you will see how men will thrive more in team sports because, you know, men hardly drop out. But women might drop out from team sport, uh, you know, because once you get married, you need permission of 100 different people to play. Uh, so if you notice, Women team sport history is relatively short. You will you have women football in uh, states like Manipur, and uh, women cricket team is slowly growing. So it also shows certain kinds of class mobility Indian women have now. So it's not a conscious choice unless if you plan it for your son or daughter, or if you decide to start a football academy. Otherwise, for most of the people, it was. It was as natural uh, as anything else. All right. Thank you. Vina. Hello. Uh, sir, uh, may I ask one last question, please? Sure, sure. Go ahead. OK, thank you. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I am Rito Broto. And I, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your engaging presentation. And uh, I, I currently work as a PhD candidate uh, in the Department of Liberal Arts, IIT Bhilai. And uh, uh, my primary area of research includes uh, sports literature, uh, Bengali sports literature, and popular culture. Uh, as, uh, as, as you were talking about uh, the aspect of masculinity uh, while uh, discussing the sevens, uh, sevens football, uh, one uh, just uh, thing came to my mind, and I ask you, uh, I would like to ask you that uh, in most of the cases, uh, sporting masculinity or, or masculinity related to sport. Uh, is is uh, mostly hierarchical or hegemonic, and uh, which leaves sport a professional sport rather uh, as as a predominantly as a male preserve. Uh, in in but uh, I I uh, think 
if if the treatment of a male or female uh, player is uh, solely based on athleticism uh, that is uh, not much specified within the gender constraint like uh, and uh, athleticism and also the animated ideas of sport that is the sporting spirit um, as we as we uh, generally know it uh, if if the treatment is uh, solely based on athleticism uh, with no kind of gendered or discrete specification uh, can it be considered as athletic masculinity which is not not hegemonic or or hierarchical uh, uh, do you find any relevance in in, the, in this regard um thank you uh, so much thus for that question um so your question is whether we can look at it um a sport the masculinity in sport as athletic masculinity instead of um or are you talking about the um ability yes yes ma'am actually A ability or or agility you can uh, say okay um it's a, it's a very interesting question um when i think about it the sport is inevitably uh, an embodied practice right you it's a physical practice so wherever the body we see is already gendered right you yes. cannot imagine a body which is not gendered yes so Absolutely. that is why it is very difficult to think about sports um without gender because it's the practice of the body and body is already always gendered that is one and second what we call as agility or ability in sport is already shaped through the ideas of masculinity for example um modern sport is shaped in order to uh, in order for men to take advantage right there was a debate in um, you know in a few years back saying there are certain sports where women would be naturally advantageous like certain uh, like for swimming in certain cases certain kinds of swimming women's body might be more advantageous but those sports won't be uh, seen as serious sports right for example figure skating right so um they, so wherever women perform well usually they are seen as you know uh, not so great sports um, uh, same um, same used to happen for working class sports there is always hierarchy within sports so weightlifting came into the olympic scene much later because it was seen as as a working class sport right not at the level of amateur sport so when we it's very difficult for me to think of sporting body um in a non gendered manner because masculinity is at the center of these questions it would be really good if we can kind of decenter us i would love such a study right but right now because the sporting institutions are built on certain understandings of masculinity certain kinds of masculine abilities right it will be i'm not sure how productive it would be to uncouple them right now many researchers gender experts are trying to make that masculinity visible for example we used to always say uh, indian cricket team playing today indian cricket team playing tomorrow and i wanted to say indian men's cricket team right it makes a lot of difference when you start naming the man right indian uh, indian men world cup right indian so that the maleness is is um, made visible otherwise we say uh, female sports star we never say male sports star we just say sports star women sports right. star right but now it's changing with women's uh, cricket team doing very well now you say indian men's cricket team you hear that in commentaries and it's very rejuvenating for somebody like me so right now we are trying to kind of uh, show us show people how masculinity works is normalized within sport yes ma'am uh, and uh, as as you uh, said that uh, sport is always a uh, always the practice of a body uh, then uh, is is it uh, something like that that the biological determinism is always there and uh, so uh, if 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 i uh, if, if if i look at it from a very uh, uniform point of view uh, 
for example, if if I uh, don't discriminate a, a male or a, a female uh, uh, sports person, uh, then uh, would, would would it sound like a, a more masculinized point of view towards a sport? Uh, for example, uh, uh, taking one 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 side of the binary. Uh, I think if we start looking at the way you are talking about it, it would be more productive because then you will see how different men are. Right. Right now, we usually talk about how, you know, women's sport is so much different from men's sport. Right. Uh, how about we pit these men against each other? Right? Then we see a lot of hierarchies among men, which will help us to unpack hegemonic masculinity, unpack, um, you know, other kinds of privileges. So uh, I think what you suggest would be useful to look at um, hierarchies among men. But even then, we need to name them. You know, uh, I don't think at this point, at least, because we do not live in a post-gender society, um, I would be slightly reserved to not look through gendered lens also. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, thanks for your comments. Uh, 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 would it be possible to uh, get your email ID? Uh, if uh... Sure, sure. I'll, I'll uh, type it in the chat box. Okay, okay. Uh, I will communicate with you. Okay. Uh, there's a question by Hanin. Can I answer it? Yeah, sure. You, you want me to read it out? Um, can you read it out while I uh, type my email? Sure, sure. Yeah, you can read it. Yeah, the reason why we don't consider sport or any any even anything that someone's passion as a work is because that we give pleasure is supposed to be their hobby than serious work. This can also be reason, right? It's a question. Um, Did you follow me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Hanin. Um, Yes, this is um, this is very important, right? So we need the, this binary of hobby and serious work. Um, so are we saying that leisure or hobby are not serious enough? Should should we not look into it? That is the academic understanding, right? So there are certain things that are categorized as serious, but the things that we do not pay attention to would be the areas that would require our that's demanding crying out for our attention for example sleep right sleep is something which we took for granted for a very long time right but now we all the time we hear you have to sleep eight hours of uh, you need to get eight hours of sleep you need to switch off your phone one hour before you sleep now there's a lot of attention on sleep because we have discarded sleep for a long time. Yes. So I feel similarly, one need to look into, uh, you know, the non-serious aspects of our life. For example, relationships, right? Those are understood to be part of uh, women's work, you know, care work. They're not serious enough, right? But now we are paying attention to it because we understand that without that, everything will break down. Uh, I agree with your distinction of hobby and serious work because everything should not be work, right? I really want less work in my life and more fun. Yes, but unfortunately, our economic location, uh, the country's economic location and individual economic location is not allowing me that. I am a seriously anti-work person. I really don't love to work, right? So I think, yes, there is... I, I think that is why one of the reviewers found it offensive when I called football as a form of work, because he might have felt that I was taking that one thing away from him, which was not work. Uh, so I understand, I completely sympathize with that sentiment. Um, but I guess looking sports as also a form of work does not take away the pleasure. You can still play it as a hobby. You can still play it for fun. Um, I think you would appreciate your leisure time more when you pay attention to all the work you are doing. So yes, that is that is indeed true and a very important concern. Um, can I answer Abdul Samad's question? What about fans' culture? Do we have time? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, so fans culture is something uh, which is an umbrella term uh, which um, pays attention to uh, why um, one activity garners a lot of followers. Right? Um, there are um, so in India most of the fan culture studies were um, associated with superstars in cinema. So if you look at S V Srinivas's work, you would know S V Srinivas looked at. Uh, Shiranjeevi, for example, fans associations, uh, film associations. What do, what did they do? Right, those were the kind of work that were mostly done. In the Bengal context, there were uh, fan studies. They were not called fan studies. Though they, those were located within historical studies. Um, the how Mohan Bagan and East Bengal fans interacted in the stadiums. Sometimes violence occurred. The, so the newspapers would report. Um, it. So, what are the attachments certain fans had towards certain clubs? Why was it so? So, if you look at Mohan Bagan and East Bengal fans, there is the history of partition and the memory of that partition and certain kinds of belongingness coming, coming up. So, a sports fans culture would also tell you um, the kind of um, attachments, belongingness people have uh, when it comes to sport. So it's not just about sport, it's about many other social and historical factors. Um, even if you look at um, Argentina and Brazil uh, fans um, in North Carolina, I, I always found it fascinating to study German fans and Brazil fans. They are very different. So Ger Germany has this machine-like perfection, which Brazil fans don't like. You know, It's not natural. You know, it, it, Argentina fans don't like it when People play like machines, you know, they pass it like this, they pass with accuracy. You know, they like more like Maradona's playfulness, right? Certain certain spontaneity is what they expect. So it's all a matter of taste, right? It's not just about winning. It's about showing that individualness. It's about being that uh, boyish, playful kind. So fans culture can also tell you a lot of um, social realities. All right, uh, Veena, I suppose uh, we will call it a day, right? Um, we, we've already reached our uh, scheduled time. So uh, thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Veena. Uh, this was very, very interesting, very engaging uh, presentation. And uh, thank you so much for, for accepting the invitation. Uh, I suppose we had uh, one of the most active discussions in our uh, lectures so far today. So. Uh, and, and we are looking forward to the book we are bringing out. So uh, uh, I'm sure we will have Veena's uh, write up in that. Uh, hopefully, we will bring it out in 2022. Um, so, yeah, thank you once again. Uh, and thank you to those who joined the discussions. Uh, uh, I suppose that's it, right? Uh, uh, yeah, we will call it a day, right? Good night, everyone.